This is a series where I teach Lama about the rules of touch rugby. We're in part three and today we'll be covering unsupervised fine tuning. You should check out the first part on embeddings and especially the second part on supervised fine tuning because it covers a lot of the ground that we will be skipping over today. In part two, I provided a formula that works for supervised fine tuning. And the formula was to start with a chat model like LAMA 7B chat, convert the raw data that you have into question and answer format, and then use those questions and answers to do supervised fine tuning for three or more epochs. Today, we'll be covering a more complicated formula. Here, you start with a base model, so not the LAMA chat, but rather the base LAMA 7B or 13B model. Then do some unsupervised learning, which we'll talk about today on a large data set. And last of all, do some supervised learning on a shorter, smaller data set in order to get back the ability of the language model to have a conversation. If at all possible, I recommend using the easier formula and training a chat model with a question and answer data set. But if your data set is so large that it would be too expensive or take too much time to generate sufficient questions and answers on that data set, then you can resort to training a base model with unsupervised fine tuning and then polish it off back into conversation format using the same supervised methods that we covered in part two. For those of you that really care about maximizing quality, here's an even more complicated formula. You can start with a base model like LAMA 27B or LAMA 270B, then do unsupervised learning on a large data set on that base model, then do supervised learning to get it into a conversational format using a small data set like we did in part two, and finally, use that fine-tuned model with embeddings. If you combine the fine-tuned model in chat format with embeddings, which we covered in part one, that's probably going to maximize your chances of having the most accurate answers and having the fewest hallucinations. In today's video, we are not going to cover the difference between chat and base models because that's in part two. We also won't cover the differences or the details behind supervised versus unsupervised fine tuning, but I recommend you go back to part two and take a look because it's quite important for you to understand how that works for today. What I will cover, and I'll try to keep it brief, is how to clean up the data sets if you're doing unsupervised tuning, how to do the supervised fine tuning in a Google Collab notebook, and finally, as always, a few pro tips. As per usual, I'll be working out of the Llama fine tuning repo. It's a private repo on GitHub to which you can purchase access in one of the links below. You can also just purchase the fine tuning script that we'll be using today. And as usual, I'll try to give you enough high level description in this video so you could replicate it all yourself. I'm on the unsupervised branch here, and I'm going to get started with preparing a data set for unsupervised fine tuning. Here I am in visual code on the unsupervised fine tuning branch, and I have the same PDF I've used in all of the other parts of this series on the international playing rules for touch rugby, a 24 page PDF that contains all of these rules. Now our goal for unsupervised fine tuning is to convert this into a long string of text that ideally is clean. And ideally, when we break it up, we break it up into clean sentences. So first off, I'm going to run a script here that just converts uh, from the PDF to text. It's uh, called PDF to text. So run Python PDF to text.py. And it's going to convert that into raw train text. This here is literally just the text that's stripped from the PDF. Once you've extracted the text from the PDF or whatever document you have, your next goal is to try and clean it up. Now, one approach is you can send it to a language model and ask the language model to clean it up for you, like GPT-4 or GPT-3.5 Turbo. That can be done just by running a script here, which is called uh, clean underscore train dot py. And when you run that script, it will convert your text into uh, this clean format here without changing any of the text. Now, this is nice and it will lead to better results. But remember, the whole premise of why you're probably doing unsupervised fine tuning is that your data set is too big and you can't afford to send it to a language model to pre process it. So, in that case, you'll have to make do with the data set largely as is. Maybe you can write some scripts 
to tidy up some superficial problems. Like if you have a patch within the text, you can manually remove it, or you could write a script to remove, say, three dots in a row or special characters that you don't want. So if you don't want to send the text to OpenAI, you could simply take this raw text, which is already not too bad, and rename that file as train.txt, and you're ready to move to the next step. Given I have my training data set, I next want to create a test or evaluation data set. To do that, I'll run Python and then create underscore test.py. And I'm being asked down here, do I want to process one chunk of the text, a chunk being the size that the language model here, GPT-4, can take? Or do I want to process all chunks, which is what I really want to do, but if I want to just test, I'll just run one. So I'm just going to run for testing, and I'll say one. And I'm being asked, what percentage of the input data do I want to use for generating a test data set? And I'm going to say 10 for 10%. Um, if I said 100, it would send my entire data set uh, to the language model to generate um, a test data set. So I'll just say 10. And now my test data set should be generated uh, momentarily. OK, so you see OpenAI has responded with a series of 10 key points uh, from the text. And these are created from chunks chosen at random at choosing 10% of the chunks in my input. And the idea with generating this test set here is that it allows us to validate the progress of our training as we move along through the unsupervised learning. Allow me to give you a very brief manual example of how to generate some test questions given a training data set. So here, I'm just going to paste in a raw piece of text uh, from my training data set. And now I'm going to paste in an instruction or a prompt below. And the prompt, which I can take from my script here, it should be this. So the prompt is, select and rephrase 10 key takeaways from the above text without changing their meaning, respond in plain text, leave out any bullets or numbers. And here, GPT should generate for us uh, 10 different points. And indeed, that's what happened with the script that I ran in the background. And this would be done over and over for each chunk of the text if I chose to do so in the script so that we have a full test data set that we can use for validation. Next up, now that we have our train.txt and we have our text.txt, we're going to convert them into CSV format by running Python uh, txt to csv.py. And we're being asked for the maximum number of tokens in each row. Generally, I recommend making this as long as possible, up as far as the context length of your model. Now, depending on the power of the machine you're using for fine tuning, that may be too much and you might run out of VRAM. So if you want to start off and do something safe to start, you can maybe choose something low like 250, but I think in principle, it's better to train with longer pieces of text because it gives more context to the model. So here we have um, a measure of the total tokens that are in our train.txt and text.txt files. Um, they're shorter than the actual input file because I'm only processing on one chunk here just for demonstration. But we do now have our test file uh, here, which contains uh, two rows. You can see that uh, a number of the questions have been concatenated into the first row, and we just have one question in the second row. That's just how it worked out. And in our train.csv, we have rows here, and um, you can see that it is nicely split up. The script is designed so that it won't break the sentences midway. It will break them cleanly um, at the start so that you have some nice uh, clean sentences here in the data set. Lastly, once we have our CSV files, we'll run Python push to hf, which is huggingface.py. We'll be asked for our token. Uh, I'll have to have created a repository in advance, and then I'll be asked for the repository's uh, URL, or rather the, 
the end of the URL, and that will allow me to push the data set to Hugging Face ready for our fine tuning to begin. So here's our data set on, on Hugging Face. It's called Touch Rugby Rules Unsupervised. It has uh, 44 rows for training, and it has uh, four rows for test. I created this earlier. Um, I ran the full data set, so I ran the full PDF of the rules uh, through after cleaning and then preparing them. I sent the data to Hugging Face, and we're now ready to start unsupervised fine tuning with our collab script. Here we are in Google Collab with Culora Unsupervised Fine Tuning Notebook. As per usual, in the other parts of this series, we will connect uh, using uh, the Hugging Face token. So you just click here and log in. I recommend connecting Google Drive. That allows you rather to download the models to Google Drive once and avoid having to re-download each time you run this script. Run installation, load the model in quantized form. Note that the model now we're going to load is not the chat model, it's going to be the base model. So it's 7b-hf, which is the hugging face version of this model. Once the model is loaded, um, we're going to prepare the LoRa setup. I talked a little about this in um, the second episode. We're going to choose a rank of eight and LoRa alp of 32. And here we'll train just the Q and the V um, modules of attention. You could train all the modules like we did in part two. I recommend at a minimum training the Q and the V modules. Next, we'll set up the tokenizer and padding. The padding will be to the right hand side. The pad token will be pad. And when all of that is done, we're going to set up the evaluation. It's the same evaluation as in parts one and two. We provide a series of questions. Rather, I provide a series of questions I wrote myself and answers. And these allow us to test performance before and after training. Once the questions are ready, we'll then start uh, and run an initial evaluation on the base model. And here you'll see um, we have, let's just look at this first question. In Touch Rugby, how long is half time? The answer, uh, then the model says answer 10 minutes. And the model also provides a comment. Remember, this is not a chat model, so it will be a bit odd in how it responds. And it says, I'm not sure if this is the right answer. I've played Touch. And then the answer is truncated because we're just taking the first 25 tokens. So the correct answer is five minutes. Uh, let's look here at the next question. So in touch rugby, how does the game commence? Answer, one, the game commences at a coin toss. Two, the team that wins the toss decides whether to. Okay, and the correct answer is the game begins with the tap and a halfway line. Um, so something I want you to take away here from looking at the answers is that um, you won't necessarily get clean syntax because we're not using a chat fine-tuned model. So sometimes uh, when the model responds, it will just give a series of, uh, of bullet point answers, which is not really the proper syntax. And that's why I said earlier, if you do want to fine tune a model in an unsupervised way, as we are in this video, which means not using a question answer data set, you're probably better off um, to then later do some supervised fine tuning so you have more high quality conversations. Okay, after running evaluation, and just based on this data set, probably Lama is getting maybe one correct out of 10. So we'll then load the data set from Touch Rugby Rules Unsupervised, and we can print out some samples. So here you see we have a snippet from the training and we have a snippet from the test. And then we're ready to run the training. Uh, there are a series of setup steps here. Um, we're gonna use the TRL trainer and we're going to run actually for 80 pucks and uh, 256 is the maximum length of each input row. So we've got that set right here. Um, if you have input rows that are larger than that, so if when preparing the data, you have 1000 length or 4000 length, you would need to put your maximum sequence length here. Now we're going to train for eight epochs and Unlike in part two, we're going to use cosine decay. So the learning rate will start off at four E minus four, which is a bit higher than we did in part two, but it's going to decay during the training. So that should help to stabilize things a little bit. Now, the key point with unsupervised learning, which I'll reiterate from part two, is that we're just sending in sequences and always asking the model to predict the next token. And based on its answer to the next token, we're comparing that to what the next token should have been and then back propagating a loss through the model. 
That's different to supervised learning where we have a question and we only evaluate the model based on how it performs on the answer. So that was supervised learning back in part two. This is unsupervised learning, which is easier in a way because we just keep feeding in sequences. We need less data preparation, but also the answers it gives are not in the question answering style that humans generally like to see. Okay, so we've set up the trainer and we've started the training. And I'm just going to walk you through how the training went when I ran it. I ran for about 80, well, exactly 88 steps and for eight epochs. And I'll just show you the graph of the training and the validation loss. We can scroll down here to the section that plotting, uh, the section that provides plotting. So right here, you'll see the training loss is falling as we go through the training. And the eval loss is also falling uh, for the first probably about three or four epochs. And after that, in this case, the training starts to get unstable. Now, in the example I'm showing here, I do have somewhat limited amount of data. I have about 10,000 tokens. Really, I wouldn't do unsupervised training unless I had probably at least a million tokens, something very large. Because if I have a small amount of tokens, I'm just going to do the Q&A based training I did in part two. Uh, if I have an even smaller amount of tokens, like 100 in my data set, then I won't do any fine tuning at all. I'll just use embeddings or I'll use prompting. In fact, even if you have a data set of 100,000, you can still and probably still should use embeddings and not do any fine tuning. So I want to emphasize this unsupervised training is really something you'd only do with quite a large data set, probably a million, maybe 10 million tokens that you want to push through the model. Still, it's instructive here just to see how if you try and train a model, you will often get to a point of instability. You can try and reduce the learning rate more, but it may just be that you don't have enough data in order to push through further. Another practical point is that even if the evaluation loss becomes unstable, now it hasn't become wildly unstable and gone up, in which case you might have serious issues. But even if you see some issues here, you can still find that the model is performing better and actually learning from the content, even through these instabilities. And that's represented here as we move through some of the checkpoints. So I'm looking at checkpoint 40, which is just about where things start to get more unstable. And then we'll also look at checkpoint 80 towards the end of the training. So here in the first question, um, how many players on the field on each team in touch rugby? And the answer is 14 players per team. That's actually correct. There are 14 per team, but there's only six on the field at a given time. Uh, you can see here it's kind of repeating in a way that's not helpful. That probably would be solved by using supervised fine tuning. Now moving on, um, how many meters must the team retreat? It's saying five, it's actually seven. So incorrect here. Um, substitutions are incorrect. Half time is incorrect. Um, so how does the game start? It commences with a roll ball at the center of the halfway line. So it's actually a tap, not a roll ball, but it's kind of getting closer. So broadly, you can see that the model is maybe getting a little bit tuned. Here's a clearly correct answer where it says a try is worth one point. Previously, it was saying five points like normal rugby. Now let's look at checkpoint 80 towards the end of the training. Again, we've got incorrect answers for the first two, but now it's getting the number of meters correct. Although it's also giving this extra information that we don't want that would only be removed by doing supervised fine tuning. It's not getting the number of substitutions um, allowed. It's not getting the half time. It is getting a tap at the start. It's not quite getting the number of um, meters after a penalty to, to retreat. And it's getting correct the number of possessions before a change. So you're allowed to six touches before a change in possession. It's getting that correct. And it's got the one point correct here at the end. So you can see the model is actually picking up more of the information. This is quite a weak model. It's the Lama 7B model. Using a stronger model like 13B, like I did in part two, would probably lead to better results. But still, you can see the fine tuning is having an effect. And perhaps if I had more data available, I'd be able to get it to a better point with results. You can also see though that just using the unsupervised fine tuning, it's not enough. And even when the answers are correct, 
it's going to give a very messy long answer afterwards. And that's why you do need to do some supervised fine tuning afterwards to get it used to a proper conversational response. And we're coming to the end of this video. So let me leave you with a few pro tips. First off, make sure to clean up the raw data as much as possible. It's probably not practical to send it through a language model for cleanup. Well, it might be, but presumably you're using a very large data set. Otherwise, you wouldn't be thinking about unsupervised fine tuning in the first place. Second of all, keep an eye on validation loss. It can help tell you if the training is going completely off the rails. But keep in mind that even if there's some oscillation, your model still might be picking up some useful information and it can be worth persisting with training for a few more epochs. Lastly, don't forget that you probably need to do some supervised fine tuning afterwards if you've done unsupervised fine tuning. That's why originally I recommended training on a chat model using a question and answer data set. It reduces the whole process to just one step instead of needing to do fine tuning twice. You can get access to the GitHub repo that has scripts for unsupervised and supervised fine tuning, as well as creating embeddings and using embeddings. You'll find it in the link below, or you can just buy the script for unsupervised fine tuning. Lastly, I've put a copy of the lecture notes for you to check out. Let me know questions in the comments.